All right, guys, in my last video, I did a bunch of math. We don't actually know if the math works yet or not. So what we're going to try to do is put the math into uh, War Smash. So let me just uh, kick off the Patch 122 World Editor here, and we're going to make a War Smash map on this nice uh, War Smash level World Editor, which we can't do because Reforge infected a freaking editor. Okay, so we're just going to fix that real fast here. Thank you, Reforged. Thank you for your extraordinary amount of <clears throat> helpfulness. All right, so we're gonna launch the world editor. Patch one point two point. No, just patch one point two two. We might have to run as admin or something here in a second. I don't know. All right, it looks like we can't use that one either. So I guess we just need to unset all the settings again. That's really annoying. Okay, just launch your old world editor. We're gonna make a test map. The whole point I'm going for here is we wanna have Thrall and we wanna be able to attack something, okay? Now in War Smash right now, it's really silly, but I just coded it. If you right click something that you don't own, it attacks it. So in, in thinking and keeping with that, we're gonna, what we're going to do is we're going to have, um, we're going to put Thrall here, and then uh, Thrall's going to be uh, attacking a farm. So like a player one red Thrall, and then a uh, human uh, farm, but the farm is going to be owned by neutral hostile, so you attack it, and uh, we're going to go to this farm. Kid farm. Uh, we're gonna actually make it use the uh, archery target because we're it's a target that we're gonna be shooting at. Uh, archery target. This guy. There you go. So Thrall's gonna be shooting at that thing. We might even make it a really big target so we can just be confident that we hit it regardless. There we go. So there's Thrall. There's a really big target. And now the next key is we want to load this map on War Smash. So that's a little bit difficult. Um, all we need to do right now to do that is I go in a hard-coded folder that is literally coded into the source code of War Smash to always go to this folder on my computer because I didn't set it up for other people yet. Uh, we just go to this MPQ build test folder and we name the map uh, projectile test. Great, so this is the projectile test. Now you can close the editor because you don't need that anymore. And you go basically to... Uh, War Smash GDX map game, which is the uh, map viewer based thing. There's also a model viewer based thing, um, but we're using the map viewer based thing. That's what I've used in all my videos because uh, it's the coolest one. You want to always set your music, you know, like, I don't know, Orc Theme 2 or something. Or is it just called Orc Theme? I forget. That probably won't even play. It'll probably crash. Uh, but what we're going to do is instead of Maps Campaign, uh, just go in here and call it projectile test. You just load that same name uh, that we had referenced and that'll let me actually play the map, hopefully. Uh, maybe, we'll see. Don't know for sure. A lot of things could go wrong. I just hard-coded some names in there, so. A lot of things could go wrong. A little bit of loading. It's loading unit data, I think. Yeah, here we go. So you can see I got throw. And we got that thing. Right? And Thrall, we already got code. He's going to try to attack it. But unfortunately, in the code for this attack, right now it's actually just move. Like, I just copied move and used that for attack. Because, uh, well, quite frankly, I just didn't code attack yet. So what we're going to try to do is make attack. He stands still and he throws these projectiles that will move. Uh, based on our mathematics, and this will help us see if our mathematics are remotely valid or not. Um, so in order to do that, uh, there's obviously some work that needs to be done, some level of work that needs to be done. Uh, I think one of the first things is, let's see, we want to first test, can he emit um, 
sitting in place projectiles from where he's standing. So this gets to, uh, if you've ever tried to look at the Warcraft 3 code, uh, the, all the ability names have C in the front of them, like C move ability, C attack ability. So I, I did a similar naming, although I, I reversed it. So like instead of C move ability, it's C ability move. Because uh, obviously if you get in a lawsuit, it's really important to point out that you, you know, it's a different name. But um, so C ability attack here, uh, this is this thing. And basically what it does, it has an order ID, it's fake. It's not the real order ID of that. But um, pretty much at some point we have on order. And what that does, if you're ordering a widget target, is it gives you an attack order. And your attack order has a periodic update of what does the unit do. So right now this periodic update is copied off of move and it moves the unit towards the target, which is really not good. Um, what we actually want this to do, we also have the animation name of that thing. So we're gonna clear out the animation name and make it play the attack animation. And we'll probably just make it just sit here and not move, honestly. Uh, I guess we could keep the code about facing towards the target. Um, I don't know if we need propulsion window though. I don't think we even need that. Basically this has some code in here that sets the units facing. And then we have all this business about set X and set Y for your like uh, moving towards them. And we don't need to do any of that. We just, we'll just get rid of that. Um, so this is just gonna like turn you towards them pretty much. Uh, one thing we do wanna be able to do is actually get the uh, the speed, the attack speed. So for that, for now, we could probably hard code attack one speed. That's really sad, we'll change it later, but we could probably hard code attack one speed because uh, that's not really the point of this video. Um, and in order to do that, you know, we'll just go in here and we'll figure out what's the attack one speed data, right? Um, speed. Projectile speed, like U A to something, you know? Unit weapons, combat. Uh, and here's the name of what it actually is. So, you know, weapon type, launch, damage, cast, cooldown. Come on, there's gotta be like U A one speed. U A one range, U A one side. Target count, splash, spell radius, show UI, range buff. Okay, well, I suppose we could, uh, we could go try to find it elsewhere. Really thought it would be here. Is it the one called range buff? Is range buff actually speed? I kind of forget. Um, combat. Death type. All right, we need the world editor. Let's go get him. Uh, looks like it's not quickly available to us, so we're gonna have to go grab it. We're gonna have to go back to games, Warcraft patch 122. Targeting 122 for now for War Smash, why not? I don't care. So we're launching the world editor again. We're gonna go in there and we're gonna get the name of the uh, speed field. That's gonna be great, so we just do that. Um, Starting up, and okay, object editor, uh, attack one, projectile speed, is it actually, missile speed, it is called missile speed. Okay, why did I not see that? Oh, here's missile arc, right, when I least expect it, okay. Missile speed UA1Z and UA2Z. So right now in War Smash is kind of a hack, you can see I have unit.get speed, uh, but as well as that, we also like, you know, we're getting something in like move order uh, we're getting the, we can, we can ask the unit data for something that's a little bit more straightforward. So we can ask the unit data for the propulsion window. Um, by the same logic, we should be able to ask it for the speed. Uh, but we want to be able to get like attack one, attack two on these things. So UA1Z is uh, attack one missile speed, right? Or projectile, I guess it's called projectile speed. Okay, so that's UA1Z, attack two also has projectile speed. Uh, and then we're also gonna want the arc for this math we were doing today. So that's UA1M and UA2M. So attack one, uh, projectile arc, UA1M and UA2M. Okay, projectile arc. So now that I have those constants, I should be able to then say, 
Uh, we'll copy one of these functions for actually just querying them. Uh, looks like there's most of those other functions are pretty silly, so let's just get this one. Um, let's see, get a one projectile speed, and this is gonna be uh, get field as. What do you think? Is it floating point or is it an integer? I guess it's an integer. That's pretty great. All right. Uh, attack one projectile speed. It looks like it's lagging a little bit there. Yeah, it's a stupid pop up that says lag. Okay, great. Attack one projectile speed. Attack now. Ideally, in War Smash, maybe you'd want to have any number of attacks. So that's not how this data is formatted, right? I'm loading like Warcraft data. Uh, we'll we'll fix the. You know, maybe someday we'll fix that. We'll make that better. Um, just right right now, it's not better. Uh, so, you know, it's one of those where we'd have to change the data as well as the loader, or maybe not. Uh, you'd have to do a lot of work for that. So we can come back to that. You know, this is all mutable code. Like, it can be however you want it to be. And right now, today, I'm doing it the simple way. So it's just going to be like Warcraft. And then we'll make it, uh, you know, someday we'll make it, you know, better how you want it to be. So I'm going to use a floating point for projectile arc. Um, that, that's probably okay. So in general, they were telling me you should never use floating points for anything that gets network synced. But remember, the arc doesn't get network synced, so I think that's okay. So we have arc and speed. Now we can query those, which means that inside of my implementation of the attack order on the unit, uh, I can go ahead and say, okay, simulation, get unit data. I still don't even know if we need the propulsion window. But I can say get unit data, get um, A1 projectile speed. We're just going to implement attack one right now, and then eventually it needs to decide which attack to use based on the target, right? But I didn't implement that yet. Um, so this is going to be this dot unit dot get unit type ID, right? And it's type ID of the unit. So this is going to be uh, a one projectile speed, and then we're going to probably copy that exact same thing just about there. Um, and copy a one projectile arc, uh, and then we'll put that in a variable. So it's a one projectile arc. So I have the speed in the arc, right? Um, and now is where I need to get the math from my other video. Maybe. Uh, probably not, actually. Nope, I'm wrong. We don't need to do that yet. Uh, really hard part, actually, in War Smash. Next is how are things invented? They're, they're kind of invented terribly right now. It's kind of hacked together to make a demo video. So um, conceptually, we are going to want, as well as a unit, for there to be something that represents a projectile. Right? Now, this thing needs to exist in the simulation of the game, as well as in the rendered world. And right now I was trying to separate those. That was kind of also why I used this prefix C whatever, because I have the simulation that's supposed to be the simulation that will be network syncing, and then I want to have everything else. So this points out the problem that if code in the simulation, say, I was kind of brainstorming here for a second, if I make a projectile section, and we're going to be able to shoot a projectile in the simulation, right? This is going to be the simulation projectile, right? Uh, like C projectile, maybe uh, C attack projectile. Uh, eventually, this would probably extend projectile that would be different than attack projectile. There'd be other kinds. I just haven't implemented that yet, right? Um, the attack projectile, you can pretty easily say, OK, in the network simulation, I was using floats, so it's not actually network synced yet. I was just talking about how we shouldn't. Eventually, we won't. Right now, we do. Um, so like C unit. You know, C unit has an X and a Y. It's a widget. It has X and Y. So attack projectile is really similar to that, right? It's going to have an X and a Y. And then it's going to have, as well as that, probably a render Z. But this was my theory is maybe we don't put the Z in the network code. Maybe we only put the Z in the, in the render world, um, which is kind of interesting. We could still probably cache on this guy. Um, so he needs to know his speed, right? And he's going to just abide by that speed. Uh, and then he also needs to know, like he's a missile, he's got a speed, he's going there. What about, as, as well as his speed, what about um, the, uh, the target, right? So he does have a C widget target that he's moving towards. So this points out, is it acceptable? Are we allowing for him to reference another widget like that? I think we are. I think we're going to say that's okay. It's weird because... Maybe you shouldn't. It should probably be a handle ID. Honestly, it should probably be a long target handle ID because then if you save the game state with some kind of automatic save state, 
you don't have widget in there. However, I already botched this in attack order. So I guess for now we're just gonna do a C widget and we'll fix it later. Right, it's bad because if you wanted to like persist this thing to your to your hard drive, you can't persist it as a reference to this other thing. You would need to persist it as a handle ID. So it'd be a bit more straightforward if I didn't use a, uh, a sort of complex type like C widget here. But whatever, we're gonna do that. So uh, yeah, so this is our attack projectile. It's moving towards the target. It has a particular speed and an X and a Y. So that's all great. And if we go back to the math that I was so recently doing, uh, which you probably can't see, but I have it here on a little screen, um, we find you know the x y math that I worked out initially. Uh, we could even paste that right in here. So basically, for the x y math, uh, we're going to have like an update function, right? And update is uh, first off, I think, going to say, "What if the target dies? We don't care, dude." Yeah, I think we, we don't care if the target dies. We're going to keep going towards it and just blow up anyway. So uh, DTSX and DTSY were the first thing. So I guess actually we have what we call TX equals target.getX, right? Um, TY is target.getY. And then we had um, SX equals X. That part's kind of silly. I suppose we could just, you know, not refer to it that way. But if we were going to do this math exactly the same, uh, you would do it this way, right? I'm just copying the exact math as we laid it out on our previous uh, video. Uh, C is the square root um, DTSX times DTSX plus DTSY times DTSY. Um, that's great, but the square root function tries to give us a double value, so we have to cast it back to a float. That's a Java problem. Um, and D1X equals DTSX divided by C. D1Y is DTSY divided by C, right? And then DX equals DLX times projectile speed, which is our speed value. Uh, but here's a little bit of magic, right? So. Sorry, this is D1x. Um, in our other guy, we did speed divided by 60. You know, like our update rate or whatever that is. Is that in War Smash constants yet? Did I, did I do War Smash constants dot simulation step time? Oh, I did it the other way. One over 60. Okay, so that's one over 60. So instead of divided by 60, we're gonna multiply by that as a ratio. That's fine. It means the same, uh, but it gives it our our War Smash simulated step time. And that way, we're not literally typing in 60. Uh, and then you do the same for y, right, times projectile speed. Uh, we could call this projectile speed, but it's already the speed of a class called projectile, so it's a little bit different than our other document. Um, and then obviously from there, uh, I had mentioned that you want to set sx equal sx plus whatever, but in our case, it's actually just x equals uh, S x plus dx, y equals y plus dy. So basically, this will make it uh, move towards the target in that sense, as far as I'm aware. Uh, now, of course, there might, I guess, be the case also if C equals zero. Uh, zero is a float, and maybe we just don't do anything because we don't want to divide by zero. All right, great. So that's good. Uh, I didn't have that in the other document, but I'm just trying to think ahead. So that's kind of our projectile, and we sort of have the ability for it to move to where it's going. But really the problem there is that spawning this projectile needs to spawn the world rendered projectile that has a Z height that's not network synced, right? So how are we gonna do that? Because that's kind of gonna be a wrapper for this guy, right? So similar to all that, on the outside of my little world here, I have render unit. And render unit is all the hacky stuff for putting a unit you can see in the world and this command card and all this. So it's kind of like what I wanna have then is a render projectile that's not network synced which is going to have in him known a, a, a you know attack project a, a c projectile uh simulation projectile and maybe i'll change my mind on this later maybe it shouldn't even be that way but that's kind of how i was going right now so this is actually like under attack projectile so it knows a lot about where it is from that but the question really is when i'm creating it how do i make sure i create both right because this guy needs to be created around the other guy at that same time. Uh, so we're gonna need some kind of event listener to do that. That's fine, though, I can do that. So basically this guy then has a Z value, right? Uh, Z value. 
as the render attack projectile, he has a known height uh, that he's going to be at. And he also needs to know more than that, right? So he is going to have a model instance, right? Now you can think of this as his a special effect, right? This is literally just like the, the model instance um, that is the special effect in Warcraft 3 terms, you know, the, the thing that you can see. Um, and then what else does he have? He's got an X, Y, Z, he's got a model. He probably has a facing, which I don't think we need to code the facing into the network synced portion, probably not. But yeah, actually let's not even do the facing. I don't want to do that anymore, I changed my mind. We didn't do the math on the angle for that in the video, so let's, let's do that later. Um, so this is gonna be this projectile that Thrall's gonna be throwing, and it has a Z value, and it has a model that you can see. So I think the hardest part is in the attack order right, that the attack order needs to somehow escape the network simulation and say, hey, outside world, um, I need you to make a projectile for me, you know, are you going to do that? So for that, uh, let's make a projectile creator, uh, projectile listener, or something like that, right? Uh, what do you call this thing? You're right, it's the thing that's going to give us the projectile. And I guess it's supposed to be in, in maybe in this utility. I don't know, something like that. Uh, this sounds crazy. It's not meant to be crazy. The whole idea is we're going to have a function, and the function gives us a C attack projectile, and it creates an attack projectile. But it creates it from a simulation and a unit uh, source right and maybe an attack index uh, which of course would be always one right now um, yeah and I think that's pretty much what that's gonna be so this is just kind of a hack that lets me um, I can make this like like projectile creator that that way the outside world is the one making the projectiles so the outside world can set up the render projectile it's not just a network world. And that's kind of weird and unfortunate, and I'll probably do something else with that later. Um, but for now, it's kind of a hack that I think should work. Uh, so we can make the projectile creator that we're going we're gonna to give ourselves in the simulation. And this is going to break some code somewhere because the simulation gets created inside of the class that's called map view because I ripped it off of Ghost Wolf. But it's not a map view anymore. It's really just like the, uh, the map world. So for that, I think the projectile creator probably, I mean, you could just even say a new projectile creator in there, right? And basically all this needs to do is to say that uh, War3MapViewer is probably going to have, uh, I think it already has a list of units. Yeah, a list of units. So it's just going to have like a list of render attack projectile for now. It's just going to be projectiles. Um, it's just all the projectiles in the world in case we need to like update them all or whatever. That way we can capture um, uh, C attack projectile, this thing. So basically what this is going to do, um, yeah. There's another thing I forgot. Okay, another thing I forgot. And the render one needs to know the arc. Right, he needs to know the arc. And then... When we create one of these, we want to have a, a creator function for that. And this is going to be the same for the attack projectile in the simulation that we need to automatically generate a creator function for that. Great. So this means now that when I create this projectile, I'm going to make new uh, C attack projectile, right? And it's just going to be the units X and uh, the units Y. And then we have this problem that we want to know the speed of the unit. And really, ideally, I would just already know it and pass it in here uh, because I already looked it up once, and I feel bad looking it up twice. That's really non-performant. That's a waste of time. But it's it seems more encapsulated a little bit if I just say simulation, get unit data, get A1 projectile speed uh, source, right, and get the projectile speed, right? Oh, so, sorry, source.get type ID. It's the type ID of the unit, right? It's the unit type. A1 projectile speed, that's the speed that we're going to make for this thing. 
Uh, and it's target. Oh, that's right. Okay, that we have to pass through. So the projectile creator um, needs to have unit attack index and a C widget target, right? He's going to pass that to the target. Uh, great. So then I can, I, this is complaining because it needs to line up uh, target, and that's just going to be the same. Cool. So that's the projectile creator. Um, pretty reasonable as far as that goes. Uh, we're going to create a attack projectile, but we want to wrap this attack projectile in, I'm calling it simulation attack projectile over here, basically, right? It's the one that I'm going to probably network sync, and then we're going to make a new render attack projectile that is like the rendered world version, uh, which has a couple of complications. So we're going to give it our simulation projectile. We're going to give it maybe a Z height of zero, but actually not. I think we want to do terrain.get ground height. Uh, again, at unit X and Y, which we could actually save off as just X and Y as a local variable. So we get the ground height at that point. That's where the thing starts. Eventually, this is going to be plus unit get launch, whatever, but I didn't put that in yet. Okay, uh, and then the arc, which we could get the very same as the projectile speed, right? So projectile arc over here. Uh, let's see, chop that out of there, and we could say A1 projectile arc. Great, so that's going to be the arc of this rendered guy. And then we have the model instance. That's a little bit more difficult. Right, because really we want to have the unit data able to query that too. So that one, uh, you know, somewhere missile art, right? Uh, which is U A one M. I thought that's what arc was. I confused myself. Arc is U M A one. Okay, time to fix that. Uh, see unit data. So this is gonna bust because U A one M is actually not the arc. So that's actually uh, missile art is UA1M. ARC is U, what is it, M A M A one AM1? It's something like that. What was that? Uh, MA1. Yeah, but I put AMA1. It's UA, UMA1. All right. That's attack one projectile ARC. Uh, this is attack two projectile ARC. And then this is attack two missile ARC. And this is going to allow us to query the missile ARC, right? Because that was something we needed to be able to do. Uh, and that is a string, so it's going to be like get a1 uh, missile art. And this is going to query field as string, but the field we're going to query is going to be that missile art field. Great. And then we're going to have attack 2 missile art, and it's going to query just the same. So we now have the ability to query the missile art. I'm going to make sure I put my little 2s in there. Yeah, I did. And this is, well, be, it should be fine to call that, even though that's kind of in that simulation logic code. Uh, right now, it's using it, an access, using it as an accessor for the unit data in general. So it is kind of, I think, forgivable in terms of code design um, that we're just going to say A1 missile art, uh, again, from the source unit type ID, right? So this is going to be the missile art right here. And then I'm going to take that missile art, and now we have to turn it into a model. So that's a little bit difficult. Uh, I believe the Ghost Wolf API for how I typically would classically do that uh, is to call load of that model. But let me check how I do that for a unit. So if I go to a render unit, when I create one of these guys, I'm creating him uh, model.addInstance. Oh, we don't even need to call load. We need to get, oh, we might need to load. So this is something GhostWolf was trying to do to be high performance. If I make 30 projectiles with the same model file, he loads the model file as one thing, and the projectiles instance of the model file is another thing. It's, it's faster that way, right? Um, it really makes a lot of sense if you think about it. You parse the model, and that becomes something called model, and then you can create instances of it, instances of it in the world. It, it's just a really straightforward thing. Um, so render unit uh, is doing that. Uh, basically, the hard part then is we got to call load on the model. And load is cached, so it's fine to call it each time, and it just keeps returning the same one. So then we give this function call. We're going to call up here to just load that model into the game. Uh, the model that we're going to load is going to be A1 missile art. And I think it should be smart enough. Maybe not. Actually, it's probably not smart enough. Um, when we do MDX model this dot load, uh, yeah, all this stuff about MDL down here. This is a little annoying. We probably want to do that too to say, right, A1 missile art, and then like if A1 missile art does not end in MDL, make it MD in MDL or MDX. Basically, convert MDL to MDX. Make it always end in MDX, so we always get binary Warcraft model, just like you would want. Uh, and then we're going to get map path solver and solver params out of the map viewer world. 
Uh, what is this mad about? Uh, we can't do this dot load. We need to do load. And then we get rid of that load call. We didn't want that one. So this is going to load the model. Uh, and this is going to be model.add instance, but model.add instance, we need to tell it to return MDX complex. Everything is a complex instance except doodads that don't move. Um, simple instances, this idea GhostWolf had for performance that I copied that is almost never going to be used. So basically, everything's an MDX complex instance. So we do that. That's just like a model, basically. Think of it as a special effect. And we spawn that and we stick it in there. But it has a problem. So this being my model instance that I add, um, I actually want to make sure that we specify where this model instance is. So we also have the ground height that we got, right? We want to make sure that we tell our model instance to be uh, set location. And you can set a vector or a floating point. And really, it's, it's a design flaw. You don't want to actually leak an, a location object. This is like the same prod problem as Warcraft 3. So if I was really smart here, what we would do is float x, float y, and float z on this guy when we actually assign these. Um, in fact, I'm using a library that I think should already support exactly that. So that's just, I'm improving my API as I go there. I just improved the ability to set the location of this to be x, comma, y, comma, ground height. Great. And eventually this ground height variable, maybe we'll just call this height because we're eventually going to be adding the unit's launch height to it. I just didn't do that yet. So it's going to put the model in the right place. Uh, there's a number of other things you probably want to do on this model, like making it do stand animations, but we could do that elsewhere. Um, it's probably fine to do that elsewhere. And then this is my render attack projectile, so then I'm going to actually have projectiles.add render attack projectile. And that's going to give us the ability, hopefully, to get rid of them later uh, and a number of other things. So this is our render attack projectile, and we now have a way to create it, and it should show up in the world. And then maybe if it moves, uh, we'll move with it. So that was one thing I do in update. When the game updates, uh, the units should be smart enough that they always that they move their model instance to be where their network simulation unit is. That's kind of crazy, but I think it's reasonable maybe for now. So we pretty much want to do the same thing, render attack projectile, uh, projectile in projectiles, basically. So for every projectile, we're going to take that projectile and we just want to call something on it that's like an update. Uh, yeah, like update animations, pretty much. Probably that same idea as what we're doing with units. Um, projectile that update animations. Not entirely clear what units use the map thingy for. Oh, they're getting the ground height out of the world. And calling inst. Okay, we want to do that. Uh, update animations this. So change method, add this. OK, great. So really what I want to do, um, given this, it does appear to be the case that when we move the model instance, we do want to call this thing dot, um, dot grid. Really thought it had dot world scene dot grid. Yeah, we're informing it that we move the model instance. This allows the, the world. If, because we're telling it that we move the model, it can hide or show the model when it goes off screen. It, it does a bunch of optimizations. And so we want we want the overall world scene to know that, not just the model moving. This is kind of an API gap because the user is going to want to just call set location on the model, which we also need to do um, on the basis that our simulation projectile might move. but. Our simulation projectile has all private fields, so we need to generate getters on those so we can be like get x, get, get speed, get target. OK, great. So simulation projectile get x, um, simulation projectile get y, and then z is the crazy one because we want it to be based on a crazy function and arc. So for now, I'm setting it to z, but that's wrong. Um, great. And I did a shift save, so loaded in those other functions get x and get y that we just generated. So this is going to make our mo our dude move to the right place. Uh, we probably also want to do stand sequence. So like the, the projectile is going to do a random stand sequence. Um, this is I have a utility right now for that. I'm using it in a bunch of places. It just says play a random stand sequence. Uh, it's just a utility method. So now we have this model. It's standing and it's moving. And this might let Thrall throw stuff, but it won't. It won't because we didn't code the concept of cooldown, one. 
and we didn't code the concept of um, spawning these, like actually calling the function that creates all this stuff. So let's let's do that. Let's let's call those functions. And noting, of course, that the z height is still totally wrong. I didn't input that yet. We're just doing a thing across the ground right now, uh, which is why arc. This is complaining actually that the value of arc is not used. It's coding. I mean, it's automatic code correction there, and uh, we don't care. So we get back to c attack order, right? And now simulation has a projectile creator. Now simulation probably also wants to have. A, a list of C attack projectiles, right? These are the projectiles inside of the simulation. And so for those, um, first of all, we need to make sure when we create new simulation, you know, this projectiles equals uh, a new list of possible projectiles. So that uh, right now this guy already has a function create unit. Now he's gonna have C attack projectile, create projectile, great little function. Uh, that's going to call it on the underlying, uh, you know, projectile creator dot create this, and then a C unit source um, attack index and a C widget target right now. And we might, I mean, we'll update those. Obviously, that's not this isn't a good user facing API because it's specifically for attacks. But um, we're going to have that. It is now an available API. So. This allows us to, uh, you know, we create the projectile in here, which means that we can also do hit the simulations list of projectiles dot add of that projectile. Uh, this is important because the simulation is going to probably be the one who actually moves the projectile forward. So, like for C project, come on, C attack projectile projectile and projectiles. Um, Let's see, projectile update, right? And that's going to move the projectile forward along the ground. Uh, eventually, it'll be moving through the air, but only because of the other outside world update. Which points out that actually the rate at which it raises into the air and back down, we probably do want in the game logic world just so it's lined up. Which is a little bit silly, but we, we, maybe we do want that. So we'll get back to that because it's probably wrong right now. Um, but this should get us a projectile that moves along the ground. Uh, the one thing that it doesn't do in the place where it doesn't achieve that uh, is that we're not creating it yet, right? So in the concept of what is an attack order uh, as something that happens, I need to say that in what is an attack order, every update cycle, we're going to check if we've, uh, if we've reached a, uh, some kind of threshold. So realistically here, what I might do is say... Um, the, the unit, I guess, needs to have last attack time so he can have a cooldown matched against his last attack time. And that time should probably be in like game frames or something, right? Um, of course, if I do that, then the attack rate, like if you look at attack cooldown times, are they all multiples of 0 0.10? No, they're not. They're, they're multiples of 0 0.05 maybe. They're not multiples of 0 0.10. So I'm saying like that number, see this 2.31, right? They're thinking that they have hundredth of a second precision on these. So for me to say that I'm just going to do a number of simulation ticks is not viable because you don't have 100 simulation ticks per second. It's weird. Um, but for now, until I work that out, it seems like you would want to just have a timestamp that's like cooldown end time, I guess. That would be when, you know, when, when is our, our cooldown end time complete. But it needs to be game time. It can't be computer clock time, right? So for that, it seems to me that game time is something I wasn't really measuring yet. Um, in C simulation, right, we have this concept of we're, we're updating periodically in each update is like a game logic update. But uh, it doesn't really have like some concept of, you know, game turn tick. So I guess that means we just want to say game turn tick plus plus on here. Uh, did I, oh, I didn't make it an integer. Okay, yeah, it's an integer, right? Game turn tick is going to increase every every update cycle, right? So just game turn tick, 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 tick. Uh, we tick forward. And now we have some concept of what that time is, which is great. Uh, the projectile is going to want probably the simulation when he's updating it. So 
This might mean, maybe, that when units update based on their attack order, they can ask the simulation for the turn tick and say, has the turn tick surpassed uh, the tick necessary? So basically the unit is going to have um, cooldown end time, right? Cooldown end time. And this cooldown end time, you know, you can we can set it. That's still not user API. We're not going to expose that from JAS or something. But this is your cooldown end time on the unit, uh, which basically is going to also be retrievable uh, and usable on the uh, the attacks, right? So in my concept of an attack, uh, and then you have to ask yourself, you know, someday are you going to redesign your own War Smash that has multiple attacks per unit like StarCraft and each little attack has its own cooldown? Uh, I don't think that's how attack one and two work on a unit, but if they are, eventually we'll split them off to an attack class and a subclass of unit or something. So um, in the concept of the attack order here, we're back to the idea that now the unit has um, you know, unit dot get cooldown end time. And this is great because this tells us what is our cooldown end time. And I can say if um, simulation get turn ticky thing, uh, get game turn tick. Uh, and these are, you know, this is ticking many, many times per second, right? Uh, if game turn tick is greater than or equal to cooldown end time, then we can attack again and set the cooldown end time plus equal to cooldown, uh, which does mean we want to be able to query the attack cooldown. Which is uh, cool. Yeah, UA1C, attack one cooldown. Makes a lot of sense. So for that, uh, this is uh, you know UA2C over here. Uh, attack two cooldown. We have the same thing for attack one cooldown. And these are currently floating point. Um, the attack one cooldown. Attack two cooldown. And we're also going to have get a one cooldown, get attack one cooldown. Right now, everything I'm coding is attack one because I was just that lazy. All right, great. So uh, get attack one projectile speed, get attack one arc. Uh, da, 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 da. But yeah, actually, I guess we don't need to query projectile speed and arc anymore here, do we? That was just nothing. Uh, this is the cooldown time and cooldown end time and all that. And um, Mostly then, what I'm saying is we're going to uh, unit dot get, or even even simulation, get unit data, um, get a1 cooldown from unit dot get type ID, right? So this is going to get us a1 cooldown. And the problem is a1 cooldown is floating point number. So if we take a1 cooldown and we divide it by uh, war smash constant simulation step time, this should be uh, steps, right? It's like a number of steps. So don't ever make it less than that, or else it'll just be busted. And we're going to turn this to an integer. Great. So this is the integer number of steps. So this is where I'm saying when this happens, we're going to say unit.set cooldown end time to be uh, simulate current turn tick, right? This thing, current turn tick. Uh, and we're going to set cooldown end time to be current turn tick plus steps uh, plus cooldown time steps, something like that. You know, whatever is your A1 cooldown steps. Maybe this should just be called A1 cooldown steps. Great, so that sets your, your cooldown ending time, right, to that. So it should periodically spawn these things on Thrall, uh, except we didn't actually call spawn yet. So that's going to be simulation create projectile uh, from you know, our unit, tack index 0, and uh, new uh, not new widget target, actually just this our own current target. Great, so that might work. I really doubt that that will work, but you know it might do something. The the we're not cleaning up the projectiles; they never play a death animation, they never disappear. But we might be able to evaluate the math of the potential arc or lack thereof. Um, let's see. Oh, that's right. I added the I added a little bit of tilt here. Where's Thrall? There's Thrall. Okay, yeah, Dabu. I need you to throw a little lightning ball. Okay, so this is what usually happens the first time. So. Uh, it blew up because this the scene camera inverse rotation. I didn't put it in the scene. That would do it. So there's this little bitty problem that when we create 
uh, render attack projectile and we give it a model instance, we need to actually put that model instance in the scene, which is interesting to me that we didn't do that before on where I copied it from, but I guess I didn't copy it. So set scene to the world scene. This makes sure that the projectile art isn't flying through the little portrait display in the dude's face or something, right? We have this concept of the scene where the models can be, and you wouldn't really want to mix them. That'd be kind of dumb. All right, let's see what it all can do now. It's probably just as buggy, but you never really know. Yeah, for honor. There you go. Now he does his attack animation, and he throws little lightning balls. Um... You know, there's a manner of silly to it a little bit, and they don't die, but we're shooting them there. You know, I mean, given that we just coded it straight up and it works the first time doing everything I thought it would do, other than set scene, I figure that's pretty good. So let's try to make him actually arc through the air, and let's see if we can turn on the audio for him, because that just makes everything a little bit more fun. Um, for the audio, I think that's Worst Managed to Get's map game. Um, enable audio. It isn't. Oh, well, that means it's not looking up the audio correctly. Uh, oh, because it doesn't play the birth animation. Yeah, okay, so it needs to play their birth animation when it first creates them. Um, so that in stand sequence in this thing. Okay, this is really kind of a hack. You know, random portrait sequence, random walk sequence, right? Like uh, r random birth sequence, okay? It plays a birth sequence. So for that, we should be able to do that. Um, and then back in this guy, when we actually create the projectile model instance, uh, I think we should be able to say stand sequence, random birth sequence, once on the model instance on, on creation. So that way you'll hear the kind of noises as it flies. I didn't do death sequence either, but we're going to have to add that too. Um, then the other thing is that we're going to want it to arc, right? So I was totally back and forth about, you know, in our in our sort of update cycle, um, what are we going to do about the simulation? Because this has this whole concept of updating the simu simulation at a fixed rate, but updating the rest of the stuff just updates, you know, willy-nilly whenever. Um, so actually, the, in, in willy-nilly world, that shouldn't be where I process the arc. It turns out I was wrong about that. Um, and we're going to have to change that. So I'm going to take the arc out of this guy. I'm going to put it in, the, in just in the attack projectile for now. This also kind of consolidates some of the logic. So I don't really feel bad about this. Um, you could try to make me feel bad about this if you want, but I don't. All right. Um, so this is going to be the arc. Uh, this is going to have float x, y, float z, assigned to parameter z, speed, float arc, great, assigned to parameter arc. Um, cool. So... That means creating attack projectile is going to fail to compile elsewhere, uh, which we can totally fix because we know like the height, and we'll just you know push up when we query height. It's going to be a little bit sooner, so we can do x y height, uh, speed, a one projectile arc. Great. So now we have height and arc and all that logic all in one single place. Uh, we no longer need to give height and arc to the render world guy. He's basically just a holder of the model. And he's mad about something because he still wants me to give him a pointless z-value, which we're not going to do. All right. Um, that simulation projectile needs to let us query the z. For that, I can just type get z, and the code editor will just write it all for me, right? So this is going to be uh, this dot get z. Nope, this dot simulation projectile get z. Great. So that gets me the z-value of the simulation projectile. i got to save all to make sure it accepts that that function exists. Uh, this is pretty good but that doesn't actually make it arc through the air yet, right? That just kind of helps a little bit. So with that, uh, the next thing we want to do in our update function is try to get our logic from the previous video recording, um, which is parabolic function written in terms of t, which is supposed to range from zero to total distance traveled. So that's also weird, right? Because, you know, what is what is t if not the, the distance traveled? And how do you know the distance traveled? But you can know the distance traveled, I think. Um, because it is speed times simulation time step, right? If I actually change this multiplication and say speed times simulation time step, 
is actually some form of sort of travel distance, um, then I should be able to add up the travel distance and use that as an input to our other guy as t. And we said z equals, um, so actually we have to square something here. So we're going to call this um, S, the, the squared portion, right? And the squared portion uh, involves half total distance to target. Uh, but that's total starting distance to target, right? So this is like starting distance, uh, which we're going to have. And this dot starting distance equals um, basically the square root of uh, dx, which would be target get x minus x, y, target get, get y minus y. And yes, yeah, so the square root of dx dx plus dx dy or dy dy. Uh, of course, it's a float. So that gets us this concept of starting distance, which then we can take starting distance and use that in our function because we needed half starting distance, actually. So um, maybe we could just call this half starting distance, right? It's mad because there's a compile error, and it's really annoying. All right half starting distance, right, which would just be the same thing divided by 2. Great. So I have this concept of half starting distance, which is what we need in our second equation, uh, which we said would be that z, and actually we might even be able to do this dot z, um, equals, well, I guess we got, we got to square something. Okay, so this is where I had uh, on the first term, the first term of the thing that we're squaring which is 1 over half starting distance times uh, travel distance minus half starting distance. Um, all of that stuff gets squared, right? So first term equals first term times first term, basically. And then um, this dot z equals negative first term plus 1 times height, which is going to be arc peak height, basically, right? So that's, uh, we can compute that once at the start, arc peak height. And the idea is that this dot arc peak height would be uh, the arc times starting distance. Yeah, which I guess is this thing, starting distance. Arc times starting distance. Cool, except that this should probably be a float. And you'll notice the other float there automatically gets removed. We'll just do one cast. All right. Times peak. No. Arc peak height. Thank you, computer, for auto-suggest. OK. So that is Z. That makes Z update. I have a feeling it's probably wrong. To be honest, I I'm not quite sure that I did that math correctly. But we can find out. We can watch Thrall throw little orbs of lightning. We can see, are they wrong? And if so, why? All right, Thrall, where are you? Here you are. Let's get on for honor. Yeah, let's get on with it, Thrall. For honor. So I didn't really see that. Let's try another one. Uh, yeah, it doesn't really look like they're going too high in the air here. I don't, I don't get the feeling they're going in the air. They're not going like underground or anything else crazy, but they're not really going in the air. You know? We really need them to like arc. So I guess then the question is, does Thrall not have an arc? Maybe Thrall doesn't have an arc in the editor. I forget, honestly. Um, let's find that out. Campaign, heroes, Thrall. Projectile arc. Project he does have a .15 arc. So I would kind of expect to see that go up in the air, even just a little bit. Um, arc peak height should be loading arc times starting distance. We could probably actually print out, uh, you know, arc peak height or something like that. Um, do that. Yeah, there's a possibility. Let's see if it prints anything out. Sorry, when I click the little green play button without choosing what I'm doing, it always does something dumb that's not what I want. All right, here we go, We're running again. So, uh, yeah, let's see. And I am dog with more here. Yeah, dog here, right. Here. 
You can see that when I move, it prints out a huge amount of stuff. Yeah, our peak height is right now 156. That's really high up, and it's definitely not going to a height of 156. Um, so then the question is, what is it going to? Why is Z not doing that? You know, first term, one over half starting distance uh, times travel distance minus half starting distance, and first term it gets squared. And then our peak height is multiplied in there. I mean, I was pretty convinced of it when I was doing it in the other video. Uh, our peak height, I guess we could print out first term, something like that. Uh, let's print out first term. Sure. That should log down here in this little display. I didn't do in-game logging yet, I'm sorry. It's just not not an immediate priority. Alright, let's see. Your time has come. They're always negative 0.95. Well, that's interesting. One would think that travel distance never updated, which it didn't. That's the problem. That is totally the problem. So total travel distance is something that we need. And total travel distance needs to increase by travel distance every time, right? So that's the total travel distance. And that's what I should be inputting to this function. T is not supposed to be an increment. T is supposed to be the total distance. That is a silly mistake that I made. That will probably make the arc do the math that I did in the other video. So that maybe it will actually arc through the air to get where it's going. Yeah, see, there you go. He throws a little missile and it arcs through the air. It's beautiful. And I think it's close to what originally Warcraft 3 was doing, right? I mean, you could sort of ask yourself, right? Like, if I if I open my projectile test and I go to Thrall and I give him an arc of one, how different is that arc inside of Warcraft 3 versus inside of my little simulation? Um, we don't exactly know, but we could definitely find out. And if we save the map, it should get loaded into War Smash 2. So I'm going to save an arc of one. Maybe that'll make an expansion map. I hope not. That's really annoying if it does. Um, it's certainly taking its sweet time to save the file. I don't really know why that is. Maybe it's because I have the brush list turned on. Never, never turn the brush list on. I hate that thing. All right. Yeah, saving should be fast like that. Okay, it did change to a Frozen Throne map. So that means we have to change War Smash to load Frozen Throne map because... You don't, you don't ever want to get that wrong. Okay, so now we have that going through the air. It still seems like the audio didn't turn on like I thought it would. I'm a little bit let down by that. I was hoping it would just go, you know, like when he throws it. But uh, it should go way in the air now, right? Like arc of one. Boom, like arc of one, right? So what I'm curious about is how does that arc compare to the in-game arc, right? Did I get the math right? Is my theory that the people making this did not think hard a correct theory? I'm pretty sure it is, but we're going to find out. Okay, let's see. Thrall, what's up? Oh, yeah, I don't. I didn't code JAS, so there's no starting ants. So now here's the real game. Let's see. Is it the same arc? Yeah, it's totally the same arc. See, look at that. Great, wonderful, and I would say totally the same arc. So I think that's pretty much how you code the arc. And uh, come back next time, and we'll make it look up the sound tables and actually go whoops which I thought it was doing anyway, but it's apparently not. Uh, also, last thought, don't ever forget to delete your d debug printouts because obviously that's going to make the game a lot slower. Uh, there is actually a tremendous time cost to a computer to be printing out numbers, so don't do that. Um, yeah, so there you go. That's how I would code a projectile attack system in War Smash. Obviously, this isn't production-ready in War Smash. This is just the math and visualizing the math with a nice little visualizer.